My name is Lauren Kenworthy. I'm from Children's National. Um, I direct the Autism uh, Center there, but we developed a series of executive function interventions, which is why I'm here. And um, as you'll hear today, we think those have a lot. We, we built them out of yes, yes. I can use the mic. Let's see. Is that better? Okay. All right. Now I'm going to start walking around, and you'll have to remind me to pick it up. So the interventions we developed, we developed for kids initially on the autism spectrum. We're now using them with kids uh, who have ADHD diagnoses. And uh, I want to just sort of preface this talk by telling you that, you know, a lot of my experience comes from working with kids with autism and ADHD, but I think these principles apply broadly. Um, and to that end, I'd like to just ask, um, are all of you parents? of a person um, who you think has executive function issues? Okay. Any teachers? Grandparents? The, uh, other types of therapists? Great. Great. So you're, you're all here because there's somebody in your life, in your professional or personal life, um, who you think has executive function uh, issues. And I have to say, I'm really honored to be at uh, Cecily's advocacy workshop. I think advocacy is a huge issue when it comes to executive functioning issues. And I like this focus on resiliency. And uh, you know, I'm gonna talk to you today about executive function, which I consider to be a brain-based problem. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm letting kids off the hook. I'm looking for resiliency. I believe that the way that we're going to build resiliency in kids with executive function is by first recognizing the fact that there are differences in brain, advocating for those differences, and teaching the kids new skills. And that's really kind of the big picture of what I want to talk to you about today. Is the audio working now for people? Yeah, great. OK, good. So teaching children with executive dysfunction to become more independent, effective, and resilient. Oh. I want to mention um, I do receive royalties uh, when they sell books on this intervention and when they sell briefs, which some of you may have filled out. If you can't send this back. So my goal for today is to increase your understanding of executive functions and how to enhance them. And I have a plan which is going to involve starting with defining executive functions and why they matter for outcomes. And then we'll talk about understanding and accommodating some specific executive functions, deficits regarding flexibility, organization, and, and planning. And then I'm going to talk to you about how we teach those skills. So what is executive function? Anybody in this room think they don't know what executive function is? Used to be, if I'd asked that question, the whole room would raise their hands. And I can see people starting to look at me like, She's a psychologist, and now she's moving into that psychobabble world, and like, what am I going to get out of this, right? Things have changed, right, where a lot of us do talk about these executive functions a lot. But I want to share with you my definition so we're all on the same page, and we can move forward together. So when I'm talking about executive functioning, I am talking about the efficiency with which you carry out goal-directed behavior, and the ability that you have to process, particularly new or or large amounts of incoming information, OK? So that's kind of a big thing, right? And what it turns out is that there's actually a bunch of different things that your brain does that enable you to efficiently carry out goal-directed behavior and process information coming in. It's not just one thing. It's a bunch of things. Um, and they cluster together in the ways that we regulate our thinking, regulate our behaviors, and regulate our emotional reactions. And I want to just pause here and say, let's make this real. And let's make this definition make sense for you in your own lives. One of the things about executive functions is they rely on prefrontal subcortical circuitry in the brain. This is some of the latest parts of your brain to develop, and therefore some of the most fragile parts of your brain. And executive functions are one of the easiest things for us to derail, OK? And so to think about that, you can think about yourself on a day maybe when you didn't get enough sleep the night before, or maybe you're anxious about a sick family member, or maybe you're in a huge rush and something unexpected has just come up, 
all of those things will start to derail your executive functions. So think of a day you had like that, and let's think of a really basic thing, like grocery shopping, which all of us in this room are smart enough to do, right? We know how to grocery shop, but sometimes we have trouble actually doing what we know, and that can be when our executive functions derail. So for me, if I head into the store, and it's one of those days where I didn't get enough sleep or I didn't have my breakfast, I may not be as efficient in carrying out that goal-directed behavior as I really know how to be. I won't act as smart as I am. And some of the things that can go wrong are very specific aspects of executive functioning. And some of them have to do with how I regulate my thinking. You ever just been on the couch on Saturday morning and it's just hard to get off of it? That's initiation. That's getting started. And if your executive functions aren't working as well for you, they're going to struggle there. Now, another big piece of regulating our thinking is when we plan and hold things in working memory. And for me, if I launch off to the grocery store and I haven't thought about what I want to eat that week and look to see what's in my cupboard and made a list of the things I need to buy, I haven't made a plan for the store, I get there and I'm kind of wandering down the meat aisle and I see a sale on, you know, ground beef and I'm like, oh, I'll make meatloaf. Do I have ketchup at home? You know? <laughs> and then I'm kind of standing there thinking for a while and I'm not efficient in that task. The working memory piece comes in when you think about how you hold information in mind to keep track of where you are on a task, okay? So working memory is not long-term memory. It's not the hard drive of your brain or the card catalog if you're old-fashioned like me. Um, this is the part, the front part of your brain that, that works with information, keeps the phone number in mind while you dial it, remembers what it is you've already put in the cart and what you need to put in the cart. Have you ever had that happen to you where you're like, wait a minute, did I do this yet? Right. So those working memory and planning pieces are essential to good cognitive organization, regulation skills, and executive function. And then there's this organization and integration. If you go into an unfamiliar grocery store, you rely on the fact that you kind of know how a store is organized, right? So you're going to head to the produce section and you're going to find it, and it's going to be there, and it's going to have all the produce you need. You're not going to say, I need to know where the carrots are, then walk halfway across the store looking for the peaches, right? You're using the underlying organization of that store to make you more efficient in what you do, right? So those are some of the ways that we have to organize our thinking to be effective with tasks. We also, though, have to regulate our behavior. Anybody ever shopped hungry? <laughs> you know, inhibition is one of the first things to go when we're hungry and tired and anxious. That's the moment when I'm chewing on those Milano cookies before I've even thought about why did I come to the store today? Not, probably not to get Milano's, right? There's something else. So inhibition, putting the brakes on our behavior, is a key skill to being effective at getting something done. Impulse control here. And flexibility is a key emotion regulation thing. If I go to the store and I got people coming to dinner and I want to make my pear tart and I'm kind of proud of my pear tart, it's good, okay? And I want to impress these people and I get there and the pears are all hard as rock and I get mad and I'm standing there and I'm muttering to myself about the incredibly high cost of food in the DC metro area and really <laughs> Giant and Safeway can't come up with a pear that, you know, can work and I'm kind of mad and stuck, right? I'm not being flexible until I can switch and say I'll make my apple pie, then I'm wasting my time, all right? <laughs> so flexibility is a key piece to these good executive skills. I want you to know I usually don't lose emotional control in the grocery store, but you know, you push hard enough and that's where you may go, right? <laughs> Does this make sense? Can you now imagine how you could apply this to your child and think about how they get out of the house in the morning, what they do when they get to school, what they go to their locker for, whether they turn things in, how they write an essay, how they study for a test? These are all executive function skills, and they are brain-based abilities just like the other ones. 
So what happens when your executive functions aren't as strong as they should be is this thing that Teuber long ago called the curious dissociation between knowing and doing. And this is a key concept with executive function because this is something that we get confused about all the time with kids because we're used to an academic model where we're going to teach kids information and expect them to go use it. And a lot of you, how many of you have had your kids in a study skills class? Not so many as I would have thought. A lot of people try that method where you go and you learn, like, this is what a notebook is, <laughs> this is an agenda, fill out the agenda. And if the study skills class doesn't go the next step to, now let's use it together, they're addressing the knowing part, the knowledge, but not the doing. Okay? And so that's a key distinction that we want to make. It also means that if you have problems with executive function, and this I'm giving you information that comes from scientific research that we and others have done in ADHD and in autism and other groups, if you have problems with executive functioning, it turns out you're not as good at learning because learning is a lot of doing, showing what you know. You're not as good at adaptive skills. Your parents will say that you have more trouble with getting ready in the morning, with keeping track of hygiene, with making sure you've taken your medicine, whatever it may be. You're not as good <laughs> at helping your parents to feel calm and relaxed. Family <laughs> stress is correlated with executive function. And I'll tell you, I have three boys, and they all have ADHD, and I live this, right? You know, if, if you're trying to take care of kids who are not juggling that information so well, you end up being their executive functions, right? And that gets old. <laughs> And they also, executive functions turn out to have a big effect on adult outcomes. And that's what motivates me to do my work, is I want for my kids what I think you want for your kids, which is happy, well-functioning. I used to say 21-year-olds, and now I've got a 21-year-old, so I'm like, 25, 25, that's good, right? I'll take it, you know? But you want your kid to be able to go out in the world and have the relationships that they're meant to have and the career that they're meant to have, right? That's what we're looking for. That's adult outcomes, right? And, they, and executive functions predict, and this is in our own research, we can look at executive functions at a younger age and predict those outcomes at a later age. So we want to nail these executive functions as hard as we can throughout children's growing up time. Another really important thing to understand about executive function and what motivates my work as well um, is that people who have executive dysfunction have a problem that affects them 24-7, right? So unlike somebody who may have a more narrow or a more visible disability, where it's really clear this kid is trying, you know, and there's some kids, there's some kids with dyslexia, for instance, where they can do a lot of things, they just can't read, and so it's really clear that when they, sh they show up at math on time, they have their homework for social studies, they get to school with the, the, the field trip slip that they were supposed to turn in, they come home, they're on the ball a lot of the day, so when they struggle with reading, it's really clear that that's something they can't do, that their brain's letting them down there, and that we need to teach them those skills. What happens with executive function is it affects you at every step of your day, and it makes it much easier for all of us, myself included, to get stuck in what I, an old teacher I had used to call attributions of moral turpitude. <laughs> in other words, that we think that something that might be a can't, something that is a learning disability for a kid, we misread it and think it's a won't. That a kid is making a choice, right? A smart verbal kid who never t writes down their thoughts when they're asked for, can't show what they know, looks like that kid doesn't want to, right? A, you know, active, engaged social kid who gets stuck easily, starts looking like they're stubborn, right? Um, a kid who doesn't monitor their behavior very well, another aspect of executive function, can look like they don't care about what people are doing. And those impulsive kids, and those kids who have trouble with planning, they look like they're sloppy, like they're lazy, like they don't care. Any of you heard any of these things about your kids? Any of you thought these things about your kids? <laughs> yeah, you know. It's hard, right? 
And so what I'm here to sort of say today is I don't know and you don't know and your teachers don't know if every instance where your child struggles or your student struggles is a can't because they are also human beings and most of us have our woke days, right? But I do know that we will all be much more effective at building those resilient, gritty 25-year-olds if we think about how we're going to teach to the can'ts because until they have those skills, they will not look resilient. They will not be able to show up in the way that we want them to do. Questions? So a big part of advocacy for the child that you're here about today is helping everybody in that person's life think about whether there may be a can't when it's looking more like a won't. And instructing people in what your kids can'ts are, right? Because I just showed you that whole long list of executive functions. Most kids aren't going to struggle in all those aspects, right? But your kid will struggle in some of them. And that's what you want everybody to be really aware of, all right? Um, so we want to take a shift from can't to, from won't to can't. And that gets us to the first step of our plan, which is thinking about why executive functions matter for outcomes. Because you know what about won't? If the people, the adults in a kid's life, think that they're making bad choices and are refusing to do things, what, do you, what does the kid start to think? They're bad. They're bad. They're making bad choices. And by the time they're 11 or 12, they'll tell you, I'm lazy. I don't care. Right? They're not going to say, there's something that's not working well for me, and I can't put my finger on it. Nobody around me can put their finger on it. So, um, you know, I'm really struggling here. They're going to say, I don't care. Right? So that outcome is almost the most tragic of all. Right? Because then they're out of the game for themselves. So have I convinced you that we care about these? <laughs> Can we move on? <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about understanding and accommodating executive function deficits. Because the other piece about something that looks more like a hidden disability where people don't recognize it is we forget that this is a brain-based difference and that we can provide people some supports as well as teaching them some new skills. Before I jump into that, I do just want to introduce the Unstuck team. This is the group of people who have developed the ideas, a lot of the ideas that I'm presenting today, and the ideas are good because it is a team and it's a multidisciplinary team, including uh, teachers, uh, school administrators, uh, OTs, myself and Laura Anthony are psychologists, uh, neuropsychologists. So there's a lot of us. Uh, these are the books that um, describe the unstuck intervention. This blue book, Solving the Executive Function Challenges, is the one that gives parents really hands-on information and contains a lot of what I'm talking to you about today. This is a curriculum that can be taught in a small group. Okay, so the unstuck philosophy is that we're going to accommodate before we remediate. Okay? We're going to get a kid ready for learning before we try to teach them something new. Okay? And we're going to do that for two reasons. One is, it's the right thing to do. Have you guys heard this term, neural diversity? Cool, right? I think it's a really neat next frontier for us in the, in the United States. We pride ourselves here on understanding the value of diversity, and we've come a long way in recognizing that we are a better nation for having people of all colors, of all religions, of all ethnicities. And now we can start to talk about the fact that different types of brains are also enriching to our culture and our country, right? And you're starting to see actually some big companies have quotas for hiring people with learning disabilities and different types of disabilities. And that's a recognition of this fact. But I like to remind people that we all, whatever your child's disability is, you want to go back in time and think about those people that we would not want to do without as a culture who had a disability that was similar. Leonardo da Vinci, ADHD, right? Temple Grandin, uh, John Elder Robeson are two uh, people with uh, autism who've made huge contributions 
uh, Temple Grandin is the national, the world's expert on um, developing humane slaughter techniques for large game. John Elder Robeson's a wonderful writer. Any of you here have a kid who's on the spectrum? Okay, Read Be Different. It's a great book. But we enrich ourselves as a nation when we invite these folks in. And in order to invite them in, we need some accommodations. And the other reason we need them is because if you don't accommodate, people get overwhelmed. And overwhelmed people don't learn very well. <laughs> Whether they're small people or big people, it doesn't work out so well. And so we need to provide basic accommodations so they're ready for learning. And the analogy that I, I think of here is, if your child is in a wheelchair, nobody's gonna bat an eyelash about the fact that there's gotta be a ramp on the front of the school for your kid to get in, right? That's an obvious accommodation. Nobody's gonna have that kid spend half an hour trying to drag their body up the steps and then expect them to get into the room and learn effectively, right? But if your disability is around executive function, <coughs> there are a series of hurdles, like those front steps. And if your child is contending them, with them without accommodation, then they are going to get tired. They're going to get less available for learning new things. They're going <coughs> to be more overloaded. And one thing that's really clear about overload is once you're in that state, you are not available for learning. Anybody ever been overloaded before? <laughs> You're rushing out the door, the dog jumps up on the counter and spills the coffee, messing up the paper you need to take somewhere, the kid's crying. There's a certain point at which your problem solving is not very good, right? Same thing with your kids. So for kids with executive dysfunction, the accommodations, the ramps, have to do with providing predictability and structure, looking for overload in a kid specifically, Distinguishing can't from won't, keeping things very positive, making the big picture explicit, and talking less and writing more. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about these, okay? But before I talk about these, I want to jump in and give a little bit more detail to the specifics of what some of these components of executive function look like. And I'm going to focus on flexibility, planning and working memory, and organizing and integrating. I'm not going to talk as much about inhibiting, which may be an issue for a lot of kids, um, and you know, I'm happy to talk about it later. But these interventions that I'm talking about are really around these cognitive and emotion regulations. And I'll tell you, just in terms of numbers, um, kids who have, how many of your kids have kids who have an ADHD label? Well, yeah, okay. So kids with ADHD, they will pretty consistently elevate for problems with planning, working, memory, organizing, and integrating. About half of the kids with ADHD also have really significant flexibility problems. The other half don't. So for some of you, some of this, you're going to say, that's not my kid. That's fine. Take the pieces that work for you. I will say that uh, those kids with ADHD where the flexibility isn't treated, those outcomes are worse. This is something that you want to target directly if you see it in your child. To learn about flexibility, you know, I'm a neuropsychologist and I could talk to you about a bunch of studies that have been done and ADHD and autism and reading disability, but instead I want you to hear it from the horse's mouth. And these three boys um, are boys who are at the Ivy Mount School, which is where we, uh, our lab school where we were partnered to develop these interventions. They all do have autism spectrum diagnoses and they were kind of excited by the idea that they could make a movie that could be presented to people to talk about the experience that they have with their disability. And they're talking specifically here about flexibility. Let me turn it on. You think that, that sums it up? Yeah. Um, Asperger's is also like, um, it's also like having a kind of, um, um, what do you call it? A clamp. A clamp. It's like a, in a, a clamp a on your brain. Yeah, yeah, a vice. Yeah. And then, and, and, you know, um, every, um, every situation you're unfamiliar with, every little change in the routine, you know, something that might upset you, gives you a core return on the clamp, you know, on the, on the vice, you know, and it just makes you more pressure, more tight, mm -hmm. until, until you really have to let it all out. And sometimes it's just, there's many ways of letting it out, and sometimes you just pick the wrong one. Mm -hmm. 
What kinds of things make that vice tighten up? Um, do you want me to take this one again? <laughs> go ahead. Oh, okay. You're the one who said vice, so go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, vice, you know, things that make a vice tighten up is, um, it's, um, a sudden change in plans? Yeah, yeah, that's um, a good one. Sudden change in plans, you know, something that, um, you didn't expect to happen, you know? For example, a flat tire on the car when you really want to get to a birthday party. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, that can mess up your whole day and you just, um, and that when that vice gets tighter, you know, it mess, it kind of, um, keeps your whole day kind of, um, uneasy, you know. Yeah. So, okay, he's describing it as a vice. How does it feel to you if something unexpected happens or if you have to be flexible? It just feels harder to go with how things are. I have an easier time at some things, but I have a hard time at other things. Mm -hmm. That's basically how I can sum up as for this. Mm -hmm. and, and so you guys, you feel like it's Asperger's that, that creates this vice and makes it hard. So, um, what I think is important about what Peter was describing about having the experience of an inflexible brain in a world that expects flexibility is that he went to a description that if you think about it is basically medieval torture, right? He says he's got a metal vice on his brain and each time something unexpected happens that vice gets a little bit tighter, right? Until his whole day is uneasy. And then he gets pushed over the edge and he lets it out the wrong way. How many of you have a kid where you can see this sometimes in them? A rising lack of comfort, right? And so if that's the situation for your child, they deserve some accommodations around flexibility. And that, I think, is where we want to start in terms of thinking if your child has cognitive inflexibility, what is that going to look like at school and at home? What are the things that are can'ts that might look like won'ts? And we're going to look for kids who have trouble accepting feedbacks, who have trouble with different opinions. And if you've got a kid who corrects people, it's really annoying, right? That can be a, an inflexible brain. People who don't handle frustration. Start something, they have trouble starting something they don't want to do or stopping a meltdown, right? These are all flexibility related challenges and if some of these look familiar to you then you want to think about how are we going to help support this child in terms of accommodations. How many of you all have kids that are here at McLean? Yeah, so I'm preaching to the choir. You guys know that these accommodations are important and that's why you're at a place like McLean that understands the value of these, right? But just in case you were wondering about those tuition dollars <laughs> and was it the right thing to do, yes, right? Because one of the things that you're getting is people understanding what accommodations need to be provided. So if a person has trouble with violations of expectations, they need to know when things are going to happen, routines, schedules, that's going to, predicting in five minutes something else will happen, in two minutes something else will happen. Those are small wheelchair ramps that will help the inflexible brain navigate their day better. They need very clear rules. A lot of them will get into overwhelming intense feelings and downtime will be a really important phenomenon for them. And we'll talk more about some of these later, but I want you to note one thing. One of the key accommodations for each of these risks that comes with having an inflexible brain in a school or home setting is what? The worst situations I see are when the kid is inflexible and the adult is inflexible, right? <laughs> it takes two to tango, and we, we can talk more about that in a little bit, too. Um, I'm going to go on now and talk about, um, so when we talk about accommodations, we're talking about needing predictability and structure. Now let's talk about organization and integrating information and what that looks like when that's a challenge. And to do this, I am going to show you one of our neuropsych tasks. As a neuropsychologist, I want you to have a little pity for me because what happens to me 
is you see your child or your student in the real world, in large groups of people or at home where things aren't so predictable and always the same. You bring them into my office, which is very quiet and predictable, and there's one adult and the kid, right? And you say, figure out what's going on, right? <laughs> So one of the things about executive function is you need it when something is new, when something's unfamiliar, when there's a lot of it, right? All the kind of situations that tend to be structured out of those assessments. So you can have a psychological assessment and look perfect, right? But you're still having trouble out there in the real world. So we try to come up with things to recreate some of the demands of the real world. And one of the things we do is we ask kids to copy this figure. And we ask them to copy this figure because it's a lot of information. They haven't seen it before, so it's new and it's unfamiliar. And they have to integrate it. They have to integrate the, the picture and the visual and motor to copy it, right? So if I were to say to you, copy this, where would you start? You'd go with the big picture, right? And then I heard somebody say diagonals, and then maybe these lines, right? Because it's too much information to deal with all at once. So you're going to step back, it's new, you're going to take the big picture, and then you might fill in the details. Okay, so I want to show you, um, this is, uh, I'll show you a couple copies of these. This is um, a guy who's nine years old. I followed him all his growing up. He came at nine because he, he was one of those ones who wasn't writing anything for the teacher, but he had a really big vocabulary, and she was getting pretty mad at him because he knew a lot, but he was not showing it. So he came in at nine. As you can see, he didn't have good motor control. He's now 24 and going off to grad school in math. Um, but he did a pretty good job copying it, don't you think? Yeah, he's got all the pieces. Now, remember executive functions not knowing but doing? Let's talk about how he did it, okay? That's what the colors are for. What color do you think he started with? Red. Nope. Nope. <laughs> nope. Green. 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 Up here. Down here. <laughs> then the next thing he did was he drew this blue triangle. You see that? Okay. Did you even think of this as a separate part of this figure? No. No. And you didn't think of this as three lines, did you? Or this as three separate lines? So he worked really hard to make that picture. He worked way harder than you just did, right? And he got it, and that's great. But then I took it away, and I said, draw what you remember, okay? This is what a kid has to do every day in school. They have to learn a new concept, they have to absorb it and understand it, and then they have to show that they remember it the next day, right? And if you have these organization integration problems, it's harder to do that, okay? And it's not because this guy or your child has a bad memory. Very rare for a kid to have trouble with that hard drive. The back of your brain is usually working pretty well. It's how you're organizing the information in the first place. If you had copied it this way, you wouldn't remember much either, right? Too many moving parts. Here's an example of a kid who has uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. You can see he took kind of a, uh, what is both a smart and uh, a telling approach, which is huh, a lot of complicated information. I'm just going to trace around the outside real quick here with this green marker, right? And make you know, some X's, and I'm not integrating those pieces at all. I'm not even getting that this triangle is actually part of those diagonals. So same thing when we take it away. There's not much there. Also a kid with perfectly good intelligence, right? So that organizing and integrating is huge. And a piece of the organizing that we talk a lot about is organizing stuff, which is important. How much time do we spend in our house looking for things? It's a lot. Parent stress, that's a big issue, right? But there's also organizing and integrating ideas. And that is really important, too. And in some ways, in the end, that's the thing you're going to want to think the hardest about. Because if your child is smart and savvy enough, maybe at some point they'll get a secretary to help with the things. <laughs> but the ideas, they're not going to be able to work around, right? So here we see can'ts that, that look like won'ts in terms of kids who might get stuck on details and not see that big picture. Don't write things down very well. Um, have greater difficulty regulating their behavior in unstructured groups. Um, have trouble linking what they learn new to something that's old. Right? 
And when we think about accommodations for disorganization, one of the things that is a natural and that you get here at McLean is you want people who will teach to a kid's strengths, right? So we can flip this around and say, I'm a detail processor, right? I'm gonna process things one step at a time. Give me a recipe, give me a checklist, break it down into a series of steps that I can follow and I'm gonna do fine and I'm gonna look like a competent learner, whereas I don't if you say, let's just talk about the big picture here, right? Which can happen in a lot of discussion formats, right? So, and help me when I have to draw an inference from what I read or a nuance from a social situation, help me to, to see that big picture. Recognize that as the group gets bigger, it's gonna be harder for me, and test me with structured formats that give me rubrics so that I'm not reaching into the atmosphere. Any of you guys have a kid who if you say, how was your day, they can't really answer it? Mm -hmm. But if you say, well, what happened at lunch? You're narrowing in <coughs> for them, they may do better, or what'd you have for lunch? Let's start there, <laughs> right? Who'd you play with? They've got that information, but they can't reach in to that big picture world and pull out what you're looking for. So think about this with your kid. When they're not responding, can I break it down? Can I make it a more of a multiple choice question, more of a rule, more of a routine? And you'll be able to do an experiment with your own sample size of one, your own kid, right? To say, you know, if I say go clean up your room, he doesn't do it. Is it that he doesn't want to do it or that he can't do it? Well, what if you make a list, a checklist with him of steps to follow, right? And you set it up in such a way that he can kind of check it as he goes and he's got a visual support. If he can do it then, then you know you're talking about a kid who needed an accommodation, right? You learn from your experiments in supporting your kids. So another piece about this organization um, uh, accommodation is of course breaking things down. Sometimes it's easier if you break the work up into little chunks, and you can see this is not what we mean by that. But. <laughs> Sometimes um, it, you can break a social problem down into chunks and flow charts. Whiteboards and flow charts are huge for kids who have trouble with the big picture because you take something that happens really fast. He's grabbed a book from, from John and he's gotten um, a time out and it's gone by like that, and you break it down into the steps. John had the book, you hit him, you took the book, you missed the timeout. Was that what you wanted? And a kid can walk through those steps and see, no, not really. Well, let's do it the way it might have worked better. What if you'd asked him for a turn? You could look at the book, you'd give it back, you'd get your TV time. Would that work out better for you? So again, breaking down things that go by really fast into component pieces. This is a simple one. Uh, does anybody watch the Big Bang Theory? <laughs> Sheldon has a flow chart like this for dating. I don't know if you saw it, but it's like huge, right? But again, you can think about when there's a social demand that's overwhelming your kid or an academic demand, can we break it out, and if your kid's a visual learner, into a visual flow chart like this, into a way that they can uh, digest it piece by piece. Okay, so we're making the big picture explicit. That's that accommodation. Let's talk about working memory and planning. I'm going to pick up the pace here because we're supposed to stop at 1230. 1230? Yeah, okay. Um, this is another one of our neuropsychological tasks. We have to figure out if your kid is good at planning multiple steps in our little quiet lab or office. And one of the things we do is we bring out these boards. And we tell your kid that this is her board and this is my board. And I want her to move her beads so that they look like my beads but she has to follow a couple rules. She can only pick up one bead at a time, and she can't put more beads on a peg than it will hold. And she has to do it in the fewest number of moves possible. Efficiency, right? Because as your kids move higher up in school, and get who, who has kids in middle school? Yeah, so you know the demands are gonna increase. They're gonna be more multi-step tasks, they're gonna have to do more of them, they can't spend their you know, lives doing homework, being up at 2 a.m. doesn't work. So can you do this efficiently? So efficiently, that's the executive function question. So this is one of my colleague's kids, and I'm going to show you her doing this task. I want you to think about the executive functions that she has to use to do this. Of 
herself. So what do you think about executive functions? What did you, what do you think she used there? Any? Yeah. Her, her working memory, retaining those steps, doing it and keeping everything working as she, worked, as she completed the goal. Bingo, huge working memory demand, right? Working memory, anything else? Frustration. Frustration tolerance. That flexibility piece, because you can't go right to the first place you want to go. Forward. Absolutely, flexibility. Forward planning, because it's multiple steps. She's got to think, how do I get to that final step, right? Impulse control, she can't just move this red bead over first, like a lot of people want to, who are sort of impulsive, because I've got to get it there, right? So this is a lot of executive functions that come into play, okay? And all of them can affect her success. And um, I think you stole my thunder a little bit with the working memory, but that's good. Because a lot of people call this a planning task, but kind of forget about that component. We've done some research that shows that if we uh, take away a typical person's working memory abilities, um, that we can make them perform as badly as a kid who has an autism spectrum disorder on this task. And I think the same would be for ADHD, right? So. The, I'm not going to go through the details of this, but you have to be able to talk your way through a task like this to have it make sense, okay? How many of you have kids who, if you give them a three-step command, it's 50-50 that that'll actually happen? <laughs> <laughs> On a good day, right? <laughs> and how many of you have tried writing down on a whiteboard or a piece of paper what you're asking them to do? And do you get a better result? Some of you are nodding and some of you are not so sure. If you get a better result, you probably have working memory that's undermining your kid's ability to do a key thing, which is independently carry out a behavior, right? You want your kid to launch successfully to college or high school, or they've got to be able to independently do what the teacher asked. You want to stop following your kid around and do that stressful frontal lobe thing. They've got to take your words, internalize them, and use them to guide their own behavior. And if they have working memory problems, they can't do that if you don't write it down. So if you're not sure about that one, keep experimenting, because that's a key one to answer, and a key one to help people at school and other places think about too, right? So for the kid that isn't working independently at school, my first question is, do they have written down you know, on their desk or in their smartphone or in whatever way they need it, what the steps are that they're supposed to be doing? The modern um, technology is a huge help for a lot of this stuff, right? It provides all of us supports to our overloaded working memory. Because in the modern world, working memory for all of us is at a premium, right? Too many things going on. Too much multitasking, which we all know doesn't really work anyway, right? So the, the technology can support kids just as it can support us in that process. Um, but a key thing when you have a kid who has some of these planning working memory problems is before you decide they won't follow directions or they won't work independently, to think about can I talk less and write more? <coughs> and that's also the case if you're having one of those things that I'm sure never happens in your house, but it happens in my house, which would I would call a disagreement <laughs> in which there might be some heated feelings about what the child has done or should be doing, right? And a lot of us parents at that moment we want to lean in and we want to talk. I told you this, I've told you this 12 times, I'm just trying to get you to college, why can't you, right? Right? Anybody ever said anything like that? I know you're smarter than this, right? We want to talk, we want to reach in and give the kid the information that we think fundamentally they need to move forward. Talking at those moments is often the worst thing to do. So another key accommodation is that talking less and writing more. Now, let's think about um, being flexible ourselves and keeping it possible, positive. Um, and here, I just want to remind you that emotions and flexibility are really contagious. Have you ever sat next to somebody that you didn't know at a restaurant, like you're there you know, with your spouse or whatever, and you're having a nice dinner, but somebody next to you is having a fight? And like, you can sort of feel yourself tense a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, tension and inflexibility, that's very contagious, right? So we have all, I think as parents, and a lot of us as teachers too, have had a moment where a kid was being mad or inflexible or stuck, we got mad, the kid got madder, and we got even madder, 
right? <laughs> and then down here is where the door slams, right? <laughs> we are the adults in the room. We are not perfect, but it may well be that it's appropriate to give ourselves a time out too. And that may be just what we need, right? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is this praise to correction ratio. How many of you have heard about this? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hard, right? <coughs> okay, this is something that psychologists have been saying for years. We've got a lot of literature supporting this one, okay? Four or five praises to every correction or command is the most effective way to teach somebody a new thing, okay? Think about yourself. Do you learn when somebody tells you what you're doing right? or when they're telling you what you're doing wrong, right? Now, the problem here is it's not that simple. You don't get to just say, you're the best kid on earth. The praise has to be true, <laughs> and it has to be specific. And I will give you a confession here. I have been doing these talks for a long time. And I have been telling other people in my office, in my clinical practice for a long time, you've got to look at this praise to correction ratio. But I didn't do it in my house, because it's hard. <laughs> and so finally, I have my youngest, who has ADHD and poor fine motor skills and not a very good musical ear, decided to learn the violin. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a psychologist, and I was like, okay, you know, I don't know what I was thinking. But there he is. He's, he's got a great teacher. He really wants to learn the violin. But practices are not going really well in my house, you know, and I'm giving him a lot of information about what he's doing wrong because there's a lot to comment on. Max, that's completely out of tune. Don't keep playing it out of tune. Max, if you don't stand up straight, you're never going to be able to get your hand where it needs to be, you know. And what about your bow? It's all the way over here, right? And it's getting really not that much fun in my house because he is getting upset and he is telling me that he doesn't want to do the practice and I'm saying fine you don't have to take the violin and we're about ready to stomp off right so I decide I'm gonna take a Saturday when I'm relaxed and I'm gonna try to actually follow my own advice <laughs> and so what I do is I look for everything he's doing right I love the way he got started Max that was great Wow Max you really worked over that part so many times I could see that you were working on getting the muscle memory in, right? So I can say everything that he does well, and you know what? He starts standing up a little straighter. He starts focusing a little more. He is not going to be a concert violinist, <laughs> but he's having fun. And I'm actually having fun. And so the thing is moving forward in a different way. And I just give you that story because I think it's important to say that a lot of this stuff is much easier said than done. And, you know, uh, I know teachers who will do things where they'll mark on one hand the praises and on the other the corrections to try to get the balance right. You know, it's something that you have to really work at. But this is the most powerful accommodation you can use. If you want that 25-year-old to go out in the world and be resilient and well-functioning, this is the biggest thing that you can do. And it also works on your spouse and your mother-in-law. <laughs> so, in that, in that case, you didn't have a correction for the violin. You're talking about generally just try to do four to one. Or are you saying with each kind of new task or... or um... The ratios overall got to come out there. Okay. So, yeah, so, so you I did sneak in a couple. Max, can we just work on the, the intonation in that part? Okay. Right. Right? So, but I could only do one of those. Right for every four to five of the other. Okay. Now, other global accommodation I just want to talk about is overload, okay? This is when anybody, parent, child, therapist, teacher, are completely overwhelmed, okay? And when we get overloaded, different people show it different ways. Some of us look more anxious, some of us get more impulsive, some of us actually kind of melt down. How many of you have kids that you think melt down? Okay, so this is for you, all right? So what happens when a kid goes into a meltdown is that they move from being in a state of relative calm, which is where they are teachable over here, to often to a stage where you get some rumbling. This is Peter as his day is getting uneasy, right? Some kids don't show a lot of warning or rumble, 
some kids are zero to 60 and they're right up at rage, right? When they are rumbling or raging or recovering, I got news for you. They are not teachable, okay? Hang it up. You don't actually have a big job right here. Most of us think at this point, we're supposed to intervene as the adult and help things go better. And there's really not much you can do. You need to make sure your kid is safe and the people around them are safe. If you're in a public place, you may need a card that you hand to somebody that says, my child has you know, a disability and you, know, you need to leave us alone, basically, right? But you do not want to do a lot of talking or fixing or teaching in this because you will only make it worse, okay? And this can last a long time. And this recovery, if you have a kid with flexibility problems, this recovery period lasts longer than we think it should, okay? So we have teachable moments and we have teachable moments and we have everything else in between. The other thing I want to tell you about this is this is your kid, this is you, right? And we've actually, this has been studied electrophysiologically, looking at people's stress, right? The adult who's around the overloaded child is also not at their best, right? So if you have trouble remembering this, keep in mind this anecdote that I don't even know if it's true, but I heard it once and I think it's great. It's an ER doctor. So you know how the, there's the attending and then there's all the students that crowd around them. And so this is a, a, you know, a middle-aged woman with all these young um, med students and she gets a call that they're bringing in an amp, um, several ambulances with a big two-car crash, multiple people injured, not clear what all the story is about what's going on with people. And she says, come on, come in here, I want to talk to you. So she gets them all huddled around her and she, she explains what's happening, what they know and what they don't know. And she says, listen to me, don't just do something, stand there. <coughs> and that's the advice to you at these moments, is figure out what you think is going on before you step in. And that's really hard for us to do. But that's a key accommodation. Because for a lot of kids, we, when we don't accommodate this and recognize that this is the time of space, when we reach in, that's when we really can push things over the limit, right? That's when the kid will say the thing that he really regrets having said, or throw something, or whatever it may be. OK, so I have talked to you about defining executive functions and about accommodating these deficits. And now I want to talk a little bit about teaching the executive skills. Because not only do we have to accommodate, but we want to teach our kids to fish, right? We want them to go out into the world. So. Uh, here we are trying to bridge that dissociation between knowing and doing. And a key thing that we need to understand if we're going to do that is that we're going to have to teach skills not just by explaining what you do, but by showing how you do it. Right? So we are in a teach by doing situation. So you, when you're teaching executive functions, you want to think less about the tr traditional classroom teacher and more about the coach you had that you loved or the music teacher you had, right? Or what you did when you taught your kid to ride a bicycle. Because it's a different approach. It's an approach in which you start by showing the skill yourself, right? You then will slowly fade away support and you'll watch for the kid to be able to do it with some cues from you and then you'll only fade that level of scaffolding or support until you see them being effective. Anybody taught a kid to ride a bike recently? Yeah. How's your back? <laughs> it's, yeah, it's sore, isn't it? And that's because in the case of teaching the bike, you're, you have to do scaffolding. You don't say to a kid, this is how, I, I don't think you said to the kid, this is how I want you to ride a bike. I want you to place one foot on this pedal, put your butt here, place the other foot here, hold it steady, look at balance, right? You probably said, watch me, right? Then you said, okay, now you try it. But you didn't just say, try it, go, and fall on your face, because you'll never want to get on a bike again. You said, go, and I'm going to hold on to the back, and then you're going to go faster, and I'm going to run like this, and it's going to get really uncomfortable, but I'm going to keep scaffolding you until I think I can let go. If you think about the coaching situation, again, my, I go to my own kids. Two of them big soccer players. I've watched a lot of soccer practices in my day. And they, I have watched the same drill year in and year out. The coach gets one kid to run down one side of the field, the other kid to run down the other side of the field. This kid kicks the ball to him, he's supposed to kick it into a goal, okay? 
they do that drill when they're little, they do it when they're 10, they do it when they're 12, they do it when they're 14, and they show up at games and they screw it up, right? <laughs> and we don't say that's a bad coach. What we say is, this is a process that, he's, that the kids are learning, and that's the way you gotta think about executive functions. To build that resilient 25-year-old, you are doing spiraling teaching of these skills throughout their growing up. And so is McLean. They're in this with you, right? So that's a good thing. A couple other principles about wh how we teach executive functions that are different than other situations is we are going to use key scripts and words. We can't say a lot of words, remember? So we're going to take a couple key scripts, and our kids may not necessarily get the big picture all the time. So we're going to use scripts that we can talk about and put in the big picture explicitly at calm times, and then we can just use a couple phrases at times of difficulty, okay? And we're going to use those visual supports, and we're going to have fun, <laughs> because having fun is the way people learn best. So if your kid is inflexible, you'll start with some cognitive teaching on why to be flexible, right? And there's some key concepts here. There's what we call the facts of life. What, that not everything is possible, right? Ever, for anybody. That's not my fault or your fault. It's just the way life is. It's a fact of life. So I better figure out what I do when what I want is impossible. And is getting part of what I want better than getting none of what I want. And we've done had a lot of success with kids with ADHD with just drawing pie charts. You wanted to go to the movies. You wanted to go to the movies with your friend Sam. You wanted to have popcorn, and you wanted to see the Avengers movie. Okay, we are at the movie theater, and the Avengers is sold out. So you have a choice here. What you don't have is you do not have the chance to get everything you want. That's impossible right now. You can choose another movie, and you will get part of what you want because you'll get the part of the pie that's being with your friends and getting the popcorn and being at a movie, but you won't be at the one you want. Or you can get stuck and miserable and meltdown, and then you will get none of what you want. So that visual can be very helpful. The same thing with setting goals and planning, right? Why is a big picture thinking important? Why is it helpful to have a goal and then think about the steps that you need to go to? Because just like being flexible is not intuitive for the dis-executive person, that idea of the goal is not so clear. So it's harder for them to link the goals to their behaviors. I bet you a lot of you have kids who want to get good grades in school. But it's hard for them to link tonight's homework to that goal, right? So making that really explicit is another key piece of what we do as we are teaching cognitively the skills of having better executive functions. And then we bring in these scripts. And again, we use these scripts because we don't want to talk as much. Anybody here, when you were young, watch the Snoopy specials? <laughs> and the parents were always going, blah, 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 blah. Right. Well, here it is in dog speak, right? Ginger, I've had it. You stay out of the garbage. Understand, Ginger, and what the dog hears. Blah, blah, Ginger. Did you, right? <laughs> so the scripts keep us from doing that. The scripts bring us back to very simple language. We're in the movie theater. You know, your child is starting to get upset because the Avengers is sold out. Whoa, we need a plan B, right? For a lot of kids, the script of plan A, plan B is really powerful because what they don't realize is all of us use plan Bs all the time. Nobody's plan A ever goes the way they expect it to. I can expect to need a plan B. And, you know, I've watched kids learn these scripts in our Unstuck programs, and what I see is there's this sort of giddiness that comes over them. And they'll say, I have a plan G. Well, I have a plan W, right? It's like this idea that you can have multiple plans and still get to where you want. You freed them up, right? And so just bringing that into your own house, right? And believe me you, you will have plenty of examples. Just hit the beltway and you already probably need a plan B, right? <laughs> and you probably also may feel a little stuck and want some help getting unstuck, right? And if you help your kid to help you regulate out loud, boy, will they be engaged. That's a really positive way for them to teach you. You know, I'm feeling stuck right now. What can we do? We need a plan B. We, there's no way around this traffic jam, so that's not our plan B. What about a plan C? What, should we play a car game? You know, just whatever. 
but where you're living aloud, as Brendan Smith Miles would say, you are talking out loud about how you regulate your behavior at those moments when things aren't quite going as the way you want. Compromise is a big one, right? A lot of kids really need a script that reminds them that they're going to have to compromise in life. And what I have to tell you, the bad news about the compromise script is it applies to the adult in the situation too, <laughs> right? So compromise you use to say, we are both going to get some of what we want here. And you live that out, whether the kid gets it first, you get it second, you get part, you know, those kinds of things. But these are scripts that can make a really big difference for a kid who's having trouble managing a moment that's challenging their executive functions. Big deal, little deal something that feels upsetting to the kid. Um, you, you don't tell them that it's a little deal. You say, is this a big deal or a little deal? If they say it's a big deal, your question is, how could we make this into a little deal? Again, it's a moment of freedom for a kid to realize, oh, not everything has to be a big deal. I can move on from this, right? So these are some of the scripts that we use and, and how we use them. We also spend a lot of time on this universal script for organizing what you do and how you do it. And we call this goal, why, plan, do, check. And we're very explicit about this. And you can apply a goal, why, plan, do, check to anything in your life. You don't have to write it out fancy. You can just say it, right? What's the goal right now? Uh, you know, your, your friend's coming over. What's the goal? Well, you want him to come over another time because you really like him. Okay, so now we've explicitly given you the big picture, right? Well, why do you want, do you have that goal for him to come over? Because you have fun playing with him, right? What's our plan? Well, we're going to see what he wants to do first, right? What if he wants to do something I don't want to do? We might need a plan B. We might need to do two, we might need to make a plan where we each do some of what we want. But we're going to make our plans that respond to our goal and our why. And then at the end, we're going to ask, did I meet the goal? Did my plan work? OK? You could apply this academically. In some schools, they use this actually for all their lessons. But you can apply it for studying for a big test. What's your goal? Well, I actually want to get an A on this test. Why? Well, I really like this teacher, and I like this subject matter. And you know, a lot of times the kids can come to that. But you've got to give them the chance to articulate that so that they're invested, right? What's our plan? Goal, why plan, do check. You can just apply as you're walking down the street. You know, my goal is for us to get home in time to go to the movies before grandma comes over. So my plan is that we're not going to stop for lunch. We're just going to run in and grab something. Right? So that they can see that you do this too. So those are some of the kind of core teaching and components of how we teach the executive functions. We developed Unstuck and On Target for elementary school age kids, the three to, to fifth, third to fifth graders. But now what we're doing is spiraling it upward, because remember what I said, we're going to keep teaching this. So on Target for Life, we use these same principles with middle school kids. Um, but we've, in, we've um, shifted things a little bit. We still are using scripts and vocabulary, but we're trying to engage now with the kids' primary motivators. And a lot of kids, by the time they're in middle school, they want some power and control in their lives, right? And if we're not addressing that, then why are they going to learn this new thing? It's not easy to learn flexibility or organization or planning, right? Anybody tried to like go on a diet recently? <laughs> it's hard, right? You've got to know why you're doing it. And it's got to be something that matters to them. So we think about like things like helping kids think about, how do I increase power in my own life? Right? What, how am I going to get to what I want? Um, what are, keeping my eyes on the prize becomes a way to talk about keeping that goal or that big picture thing in, in mind. Um, for the middle school kids, we talk about flexibility and that big picture thinking with the goal I plan check, plus being respectful and thinking about others. We talk about this as an equation. That will add up to more choices. They can reach their goals. They can reach their, get the rewards they want in life. And now we've also spiraled it up to high school with flexible futures. Preparing kids for college is really what the purpose of this is. And again, we're using a lot of the same concepts. We're, we're talking about um, being flexible and having big picture thinking as opposed to getting stuck on a detail or um, losing sight of the big picture. Um, but we're doing it in terms of kind of a, a an equation for them that talks about ways they can lose power in their world or ways they can boost their power. 
and ways that their eye, eyes come off their own prizes versus ways that they stay on. With the high school students, we try to think about big picture ways to think about um, how they're going to manage their time because that's a big issue for people with executive problems. So anybody here have a kid you're paying tuition for in college? I do, and this graph freaked me out because this is, comes from the federal government. Somebody's done some estimate of how the average college student spends their time. Look at this, educational activities, three hours. <laughs> That's $50,000 a year right there. <laughs> like, but we show kids, this is what, you know, a, 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 a typical kid in college, this is the way they have to think big picture about their day and divide up their time and manage their time. Again, a key organizational skill. And then we have them make their own pies. And then they show each other their pies. And they are often most influential with each other about what it looks like. So a kid will bring in a pie. This is how I spent my week. And then we can ask, is that a danger pie or a balanced pie? What do you think on this one? Danger. Yeah. What are you worried about? Overworking. And the sleep. The lack of sleep. Right. Some kids come in and their pie is like 90% playing a video game. Mm -hmm. And I watched this happen just recently in one of our groups and the other kids were like, Sam, not his real name, that, what's that about? <laughs> and he was embarrassed in a way that his parents could have never gotten across to him. Believe you me, they had had the discussion, right? <laughs> so this idea of kind of making it visual, putting the big picture out there on a piece of paper is a really powerful one for helping a kid think about, what am I trying to do with my life? What are my goals? How do I get more power? How do I get more independence? How do I go where I'm headed? We, we do the plan. Um, Plan B and the check a little bit differently there, but we keep this as a universal script in all of our interventions. Um, so I just want to, I'm just winding up, but I just want to just show you one piece of data to bring the sort of circle back to say that the, when we teach executive functions in this explicit way, when we're able to partner with teachers, which we do the trainings at school, and with parents who do the, tr the work at home, we really do see a difference in some of the core skills that I think you're looking for for your kids. This comes from a randomized control trial, so we randomly assigned kids to two different things. One was the unstuck intervention based on the principles I'm telling you about. The other was Jed Baker's social skills intervention because these kids were on the autism spectrum. We're now running this trial with ADHD, but we don't have that data yet. I'll talk to you about that next year. But, um, but in this case, we compared two interventions. They, kids, parents, teachers got exactly the same amount of training and attention, so it was matched for dose, as we say in the business. Mm -hmm. And we did blinded classroom observations. So one of our research assistants just sat in the back of the class and coded kids for what they did. <coughs> and they coded how much they followed the rules, how easily they made transitions, how much of the time they were negative, and how well they participated. And what we saw was on this y-axis improvement. And the good thing is all the kids, whatever intervention they were in, improved. And they should. People were spending a lot of time and working on skills. But you see these dramatically bigger uh, improvements around being able to follow rules. This is working independently, right? Around being able to participate effectively, staying positive, making transitions in the kids who had this executive function training. So, you know, 60% improvement, 40% improvement. So I just show that to you as one example to say we are interested in the evidence behind this. And you always want to ask that question before you put your time into these kind of interventions. And so far it's looking good. We're in the middle, as I said, of a much larger trial with kids with ADHD as well, and we'll tell you what we find out about that when we do. We obviously are not the only game in town. There's some other really good um, uh, books out there on executive function. Uh, Dawson and Guare have Smart But Scattered. Uh, Cooper Kahn and Dietzel, Late Loss But Unprepared. These are great books, and um, I recommend them. And I think that's where I stop. So I can leave that, actually, do you want me to leave that one up? So um, oh, I didn't make time for questions. I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. Um, if the school wants them to be, I can share them with them, absolutely. Yes? Uh, 
That is so hard. How do you distinguish anxiety from some of these executive things? Let me tell you, working memory and anxiety, they live in a little circular um, nasty nest, right? Like, just think about yourself. Remember directions when you're late to a job interview? You can't, right? You know, so it's very difficult. I do have specific ways that I look for that. And um, one of them is I want to know how anxious the kid is generally. And another is, again, I want to know if the working memory issues have predated the presence of the anxiety. But in general, I don't really care. If a kid is anxious and has poor working memory, I want to approach both those problems. I want to support the working memory, and I want to um, do the cognitive behavioral work around the anxiety. And the same people can do both interventions. So, um, you know, double, double barrel approach. Yes? Um, what would be your um, analysis or take on why a strict social skills program wasn't as effective as the Young Stuff program? Because we were explicitly teaching those executive skills, and those are very supportive actually to a lot of social skills. You need a lot of executive skills to be successful socially. It's why a lot of kids with ADHD have some social problems. Um, you know, if you're melting down in the classroom, people don't necessarily want to be your friends, you know. Um, if you don't see the big picture, the playground is a really complicated <coughs> place to be. So I think, you know, I don't minimize the importance of social skills intervention, but I think this adds something unique, and in this case was really effective. Yes, in the back. What's, you. The, what's the relationship between uh, executive function and autism spectrum and ADHD? Like, how do those things interact with you? Yeah, good question. So executive function is a cognitive um, disability. ADHD and autism are behavioral diagnoses. So it's not that if your kid has organization and planning problems and ADHD, they don't have two things. They have one thing that's being described by behaviors, loses stuff, right, spacey, and then being described the same thing by cognition, isn't organizing or integrating information. From my perspective as a neuropsychologist, you have behaviors. They're kind of the final downstream effect. They're what we see and react to. But behind those, are the cognitive issues that make it hard, right? I see you can't read, but you can't read because you don't have phonological ability to decode. And behind those is a different brain. And these are all neurogenetic disorders. So we know it's starting with brain, changing cognition, which affects behaviors. The reason I like to talk about the cognition is I like to take a step back from behaviors because I feel like it gives us all more power. We, we're not as reactive. We're more able to think preventatively. Is that just Yes. I'm wondering what do you do when your child is older and all of these things haven't been addressed? How old? 18. Okay, so you got an 18 year old. It is not too late. I want to tell you guys something really exciting. And it's not going to help a lot of us in this room, but it's going to help all your kids. Executive functions are the latest developing skill, a uh, uh, set of, they're supported by the latest developing neural components in the brain. So this prefrontal subcortical circuitry I keep talking about, it matures up through 30 years of age. I'm on the downhill swing. <laughs> your 18 year old is not, okay? There's still time to intervene and you're intervening in a plastic situation and that's exciting because you can really shift a trajectory. That's why we do groups, you know, at Children's we do groups for these kids. We see a lot of kids who flunked out of college. You know, it's a really common thing, and then we're coming back and trying to figure out how to make that work. Um, so a lot of these techniques can still be applied. Now, I wouldn't say to your 18-year-old, is that a big deal or a little deal, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? That's where you're more thinking about those power loss, power gain, you know, kind of pieces. And motivation is fundamental. If you've got an 18-year-old, go um, Google Daniel Pink on the, on the um, internet and you'll get this great little thing on motivation that I showed my 18 year old with ADHD recently uh, where he's talking through what motivates us and you, you've got to start at that point, not at that video, but at that point of motivation with somebody of that age because they've had too many failure experiences. Mm -hmm. Yes? So uh, this probably depends on how 
dysfunctional, I guess, so the executive dysfunction is, but is there hope for just like beating this and like eventually you've used enough strategies and like things aren't as difficult for you or is it always just kind of something you're gonna carry with you that? So is there hope for beating this if we get enough strategies? Are we gonna? I mean, yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I understand, because you're creating, yeah. you're saying it's elastic so you're, or plastic, so you're creating kind of. So there are definitely changes. And because I've been in this field for a while clinically, I have these great moments where kids come back and it's like, wow, you're so much better. There's also moments where you look worse. Because as your executive skills increase, what we expect of you increases. And when that's out of sync, like the 18-year-old, if he's headed into college, he's about to hit a huge new demand, right? Generally leaving secondary school is a big increase. So that's one thing, is that there's plateaus and there's moving forward and they may not always be in sync. The other thing that I'd say to you is when I think about this, I think about um, an analogy where I see kids running a racetrack. And if you have intact executive functions, you're just running the track normally. If you've got executive dysfunction, you're running the track but there's a hurdle every couple yards so you're jumping hurdles you're getting tired you have to do more mm -hmm. what we what these techniques are doing are building your muscles right we're building strategies and routines to work around you will always need some of those but if you've got thighs like forever you're keeping up with the kids that are running the track who cares you actually can come out with it with much better self-knowledge than a lot of kids who don't go through this process